right, we're going to get started recording episode 18, and I think you're going to enjoy this episode for its randomness. Just you wait. Welcome back to Finding Your Identity. This is episode 18, and I'm your host, Derek McKinney, and I'm going to take you on a fun and wild ride of randomness and unknown identities and this is like the antithesis of finding our identity or the frustration that comes from not being able to find an identity or you know just some fun facts that I'm going to just kind of spit out here because I was thinking that it's kind of an interesting idea to talk about people who we don't know who they are necessarily or they've been, you know, deemed as as kind of forgotten from history and from society but yet what they did may have la- you know created a lasting impact on society and and this world because they are remembered and in their unknown forms. So that's what this episode is going to be about. And it's going to be some interesting information, things you maybe have heard about before or, or maybe didn't know a lot about. And I'm going to cover them with a, a little bit of detail, but it should be a fun, somewhat light hearted episode. Although there is a little bit of morbidity to a couple of them, just by the nature of they are being unknown and their identities are unknown because they unfortunately, you know, passed before their time and were not able to be identified necessarily. And so there is that little warning that I want to throw out there, that little disclaimer that, you know, this may not be intended for all audiences. So starting probably with one of the the lighter ones. And I think, you know, maybe a lot of people know about this one and it's somewhat a famous one in history, but they, um, they call it the, the VJ day sailor. There was, you know, a famous painting, um, famous picture, I should say, um, that was hung in, I think it was in the Met the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, I believe it was in, it was actually featured as a painting, which I don't know if it was necessarily in this museum, but in the Night at the Museum movies, it was featured as a, as a painting in which one of the, the characters disappeared into because, you know, the museum came to life at night. Uh, sorry if I might have spoiled that movie for, for you, but the, you know, Night at the Museum there this famous painting and what it is is it, it's a famous painting of this sailor who had grabbed a nurse and kind of leaned her back to kiss her in a celebratory kiss because it, you know all the sailors were coming home from the war and it was you know after the the victory with uh you know over japan in world war Two, and it was a Uh, time to celebrate you know because all the soldiers were coming home and i believe this was in new york city i yes it was in times square that's right and this you know random picture was kind of snapped in it and i think it, it gained in popularity throughout the years but you know it's known as of a famous snapshot in time of you know the end of a of the great war the the second great war um and and it's a famous picture and nobody knows who the two people were in it there's speculations there's some people who came forward but nothing was ever corroborated there was no conclusions that proved that anybody who came forward was the actual participant in in either side the the sailor or the female nurse that were you know participating in that celebratory kiss so that one's kind of an interesting unknown and you know these two identities are unknown and if you 
actually look up the the VJ, the VJD sailor and you look it up and you look at the pictures of it you'll see that it's you know the two faces are together because they're kissing so there's really no true way to to really identify them by any kind of features so i thought that was kind of an interesting one the next person who we do not know who they are is agent uh, agent 355 that was a little slip i gotta fix is agent 355 and agent 355 was this female spy during the american revolution who worked as a part of the culper ring which if you don't know what the culper ring is it was actually this spy ring that was formed at the order of george washington to try to glean as much information as possible about the british obviously that was in his best interest because we were at war with britain at the time and george washington asked a man named major benjamin talmadge to create this organization this spy ring and there's actually a popular tv show on amc called turn that is about washington's spies his spy ring and that's what the culper ring was i mean this was this you know covert organization it's probably the first instance of of a cia type spy organization in history in this country and which is america just to clarify and you know the united states they had a a deep need to gain as much leverage as they possibly could against the british because they were just this massive empire and you know people who know the history of the revolutionary war and obviously how america was born and, and came to win its independence you know it 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 was a lot of actually you know not necessarily war acts that that really kind of sealed the deal there like a lot of it had to do with the spies the spies the spy network that george washington had you know ordered be created was integral in kind of sealing the deal per se in terms of being able to to gain a leg up on on the enemy and you know it was a very successful network i mean that's that's like one of the the big reasons why george washington could be ahead of the british army you know and, and have his armies be one step ahead when possible but agent 355 she's one of the most you know i guess um she was a very mythical mythical figure you know so she she's the one that's that's remembered well but nobody knows her actual identity you know and it's it's said that her number the the 355 was something that was that was um decrypted from the system that the culper ring had used and actually meant lady was translated and agent 355 was you know instrumental in in a lot of uh passing a lot of information to george washington to to help you know with the war efforts so it's kind of interesting and and you know she's she's interesting and you know, in that same note, there was a lot of spies, and I'm sure don't get a lot of credit. That AMC show follows uh, Abe Woodhull, who was a spy who was kind of torn between being a, a Tory or a, a British loyalist and and wanting independence. And kind of, you know, that the the show kind of follows how he, you know, tr she he had to to um 
struggled to to toe the line there to find his place, I guess, you know, find his identity in a sense. If I could throw in a plug for the name of the show, but you know, find out what he wanted to be in terms of leaving his mark on history, you know, and and that was that was something that you have to imagine was really tough in that time frame, you know. And you think throughout history, all the times when people had to make those tough choices and decide which side they were on, you know, that that's one of those examples because it's, you know, it's never clear at the time. Like, I'm sure he was nervous. Like he thought like, well, what if I am a spy or what if I get caught? Obviously I'll be executed. Or what if I picked the wrong side? What if, you know the British weren't so bad, uh, you know, like he maybe had these thoughts and, and that could have easily been the wrong decision, but he, he believed in, in what was going on and he, he kind of stuck to his guns, you know, and, and agent fifty three fifty five was also in that same group who believed in, in the, the new America kind con- concept, you know, and, and supported it wholeheartedly. So that made for, you know, an interesting story and an interesting tale. And it's, it's pretty amazing that it was kept such, uh, with, with such secrecy that her true identity was never exposed. So that's just kind of a, an interesting, another interesting unknown person in history. Another person who actually, you know, had to risk a lot to to kind of stand up for their beliefs was an unknown person that goes by the name Tank Man, who was famously pictured in the Tiananmen Square massacre photograph where he's standing in the middle of the road and there's four tanks, I think four tanks or three, four tanks, but they're, they're lined up and stopped and he's just kind of standing there and it's an impactful moment. And there's kind of speculation as to who he might've been, but there's nothing that's ever been, you know, set, set in the record straight about his true identity. And then there's speculation that he was immediately taken away and killed. There's other you know, evidence that he was, he actually was able to walk away, that the tanks didn't fire on him because they, they, you know, I don't know if he was an old wise man looking guy or something, but he maybe looked like he was to be respected. And so he didn't budge and they didn't budge. And and then eventually he kind of walked on and, and he made his, his point and he made a big impact in, history you know and he was standing up for for the right to to have democracy you know in china so that's what the the tiananmen square incident was and and you know interestingly the chinese government i I believe still does this they they block searches i think that was a big controversy with with google going into china uh if they I don't know if they ever actually fully went in there, but there was, you know, all this debate because the Chinese government didn't want to allow their citizens to search Tiananmen Square in the massacre because, you know, they didn't want it to ever happen again and have these protests erupt. But there was a lot of people who, who, you know, were pro-democracy supporters who were involved in that, that, protest and it was unfortunate that it turned out to you know end very badly with with a lot of you know unnecessary deaths but this man the tank man was famous for standing in front of these tanks and not being known who he was and and it was more of a snapshot in in history of a person that was you know standing up for their beliefs now i think there's obviously some of the the lighter ones where we can assume that those people, you know, lived happy, healthy lives after their famous in- incidents. But there are some where, you know, this is a sad case because this next one is, you know, 
the shadows that were left behind after the Hiroshima bomb went off. So for those who don't know, and at the, you know, the end of World War II, the United States dropped uh, an atomic bomb on Hiroshima in Japan and also in Nagasaki. And they killed a lot of people. It was a, a huge bomb. It was, it was a devastating bomb. It, it destroyed a city. It literally, you know, caused human beings to just disintegrate because the, the heat and the energy was so strong. And what kind of leads to this, this shadow person or people was the fact that there were these shadows left behind. So after the dust settled from the bomb, people, you know, went out and they, they looked around and, and it had to have been uh, an immense amount to try to digest after seeing that, but they would go out and, and somebody found and photographed these shadows that were left imprinted on the steps. And it was a shadow that was essentially burnt in to the steps from the shadow of a person like the uh, it's hard to explain like but you'd have to actually look it up to see it and and I'll tell you I would warn you you know it could be a little disturbing to some people but you know it was just the fact that the the, the heat was so immense that it it left this this shadow burnt shadow like black splotch or whatever in the shape of a person and also you know what looked like the shape of a cane so for you know for one of them where it it just looked like you know the person had just been caused to to disappear in a sense as if they were just walking up the steps with a cane and then this bomb went off and it happened so fast you know they they obviously couldn't get cover or anything like that but all that was left behind was the shadow and so that's just kind of nuts like to me to think about like that there's some kind of massive energy out there so strong that humans possess that that ability to unleash it on other humans and that it could do that that kind of thing you know it could you know be so intense that it it doesn't leave the trace of any kind of person it just leaves you know this shadow of a person so that is just you know I, I think something that you gotta kind of stop and think and you know not to be preachy about peace but peace seems a lot better than being left as a shadow you know quote that and put it on a t-shirt so that's that's another instance because nobody there's no way to ever know the identity of that person so that's somebody you know who's gone and and can only be remembered by this this little bit of evidence that this person ever existed so that that's kind of heavy now there's some mystery behind why people think it's fascinating or have this desire to venture out in sub zero degree weather with just you know uh, spending an exorbitant amount of money carrying crazy expensive gear and risking their lives where they have probably a really high probability of dying to climb mount everest so you know that that alone is a mystery why would people think that was a good idea i i think obviously it's humans adventurous spirit and it's something that i don't think i've ever had any kind of desire to do now i i do like hiking and i do like summiting like reasonably high cliffs or or mountains but you know I, i'm i'm kind of realistic and as i told you in my my camping story in the previous episode where you know i ventured out with a 50 pound pack just to hike for a couple hours and it nearly killed me i can only imagine how quickly i would die on everest trying to hike up that 
But needless to say, in recent times, actually in 2017, there were four uh, hikers that were that were found. Their bodies were found. They were dead in a tent, and they were unable to identify them. And the crazy thing about this, because I, you know, this popped up when I was just kind of digging into some of the stories, doing a little research on, you know, unidentified bodies and and things that kind of come up in the news. And this popped up when I was doing the search and you know, what's really crazy about this is, is there's a lot of bodies on Everest and you know, that kind of blew my mind a couple years ago when I started seeing these stories and then I started actually doing research and then I ended up watching YouTube videos and looking at pictures and you know, how you sometimes go down a rabbit hole of discovery and you just start unveiling things that you just never could even imagine and and it's like you know they say looking at a train wreck you just can't look away but it's insane because there's a ton of bodies that are basically just frozen in place and it's too dangerous to actually extract them either they're frozen to the ground so they they physically have no way of removing the bodies or it would just be too dangerous to extract the bodies but there's a ton of bodies left up on Everest and, and, you know, parenthetically, there's a bunch of trash too, which is in, 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 you know, human waste, which is kind of nasty. It's frozen, but the bodies is, is a little disturbing because, you know, they're actually used as trail markers. <laughs> like I've seen a couple things that say, you know, um, one of the most famous bodies is, nicknamed green boots i guess the the person had green boots uh they did uh, eventually identify this person but he's a trail marker because his feet are are kind of obstructing the trail slightly and there was an overhang and it and it's kind of sad because this guy was essentially just hugging himself to try to stay warm and had covered his face to try to prevent you know, further cold on his face. And, you know, people say he looks like he's, he's taking a nap, but he probably was just freezing. And, and there's all, all types of, of things that have happened with avalanches or blizzards come in, or, you know, you run out of oxygen and a lot of the deaths have happened because of that. And it's just insane to think, you know, that people continue to go up this mountain to summit Everest. But, you know, how could you, how, how, what are you thinking when you have to step over a dead body? Like, that's just kind of bizarre and, and twisted to me. But that's just me. And, you know, a, another instance that I can tell a story of this, you know, the unidentified, the unknown identities of people and and that's unfortunately some travelers that went up Everest and and it's kind of crazy because you know from from what I've I've read just cuz like I said I went down a rabbit hole looking up Everest that you know it's like 10 11 grand for a permit and the Nepalese government just issues permits just because they just want that money they just keep collecting that you know 10 11 grand and there's only a small, like a short window that you can actually climb Everest. And it's it's in the spring and it's somewhere in May, I think. And I think it's only three or four weeks. And that's the only window that you can actually do it. And it's just, there's, it's a nightmare. Like this 2019 season, I guess there were traffic jams and like apparently, you know, that that's, well, not apparently that is very dangerous, but apparently that was, that was causing a lot of concern because, you know, the, the, the concern is obviously when you have a, a backlog of people trying to summit and you can't go forwards or backwards, you know, people essentially die and, and they just could just fall off. Just, you know, you got a thin trail and, and you get disoriented or something and you just fall off the side of the mountain and you're gone and then that's it and that's that's kind of nuts there there's a movie i think called everest 
that was about, you know, one of the tragic days on the mountain when, you know, something like, I don't know how many people it was, 10 to 15 people died in this because this storm kind of came in uh, somewhat unexpectedly or, or, you know, a lot of like the, the movie kind of paints it as, as just error and judgment, but these people you know went up to to summit and and they just kind of stayed a little bit too long or they just went up too late and they didn't have enough oxygen with them and the timing was off and the storm rolled in and and you know it's based on a true story and like one of the guys you know he ended up like losing his like fingers and toes or something like that um but his wife was you know very vigilant and and diligent and you know she 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 kind of got a um a heads up that that he was trapped up there and then she did everything she could and she managed to charter a helicopter from like some crazy pilot who basically was willing to go fly up there to rescue this guy so that guy ended up getting rescued but you know he ended up suffering the consequences cuz he ended up losing mm-hmm. like his fingers and toes so that's kind of a sad ending to that but needless to say that's just you know people take their lives in their hands and then what's the result you know what's kind of crazy about the four people that are unknown is they didn't have any kind of records of it so you, you got to wonder like how did how did this happen but but then you think well it's so overcrowded up there like maybe they just found a way maybe they they were able to bribe the right people but they basically snuck their way up there but didn't have the proper gear and perished so that's sad but another story of unidentified people that probably will remain in history, at least the history of climbing Everest. And, you know, I've shared that now forward with you. And you can go tell your friends not to climb Everest, and this is why. But it's, um, it's interesting. Like, these are just kind of, you know, small examples of people that, essentially left a a impact in some way on the world. I think it's always, you know, from my perspective, it's always something in human nature to try to leave some kind of impact in life and, and leave something behind, you know? I mean, I think people have been doing it for, for millions of years or, or thousands of years, maybe not millions. Yeah. Millions would be like maybe the aliens that were, secretly leaving messages i don't i don't believe that's true but um let's say thousands of years because thousands of years ago there were cave paintings and that was people leaving their mark now that was the only form of of writing that they could could pass along to their you know what they could imagine is their next generation of 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 children and and relatives but you know that's how they kind of tried to live on but you don't know the identities of the people who created those cave paintings necessarily you don't know that it was you know i don't even know what would a cave person's name be i'll say grug because i love the crudes i thought that was a great movie you know but nobody knows grug anderson was the one who actually painted the you know the 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 giant saber-toothed cat attacking his family you know and you can't trace it back he didn't exactly you know sign it like ga at the bottom so there's tons and tons of examples throughout history of people who essentially did things without expecting any kind of recognition for it and you know left an impact or made an impact on future generations you know i i love the idea of of authors you know writing books that essentially are are imprinting in history in a sense because they're they're forever going to be in history you know if at at least if you've got a couple copies out there you know but you publish a book out and and it gets distributed in any form even if you self-published it and you just handed it out to your family members like it it could live on for however long you know that it stays alive and it it you know and i say stay alive 
you know, hopefully doesn't burn up in some kind of fire or something like that, but, but gets passed along, you know, I mean, I've got little books that my grandmother had, had given me and, along with other books, but, you know, I've actually had a ton of old books that my, my grandfather had that I just took when he passed away, you know, because I thought it, it always would let me re- remember him, but it's in a sense that author wrote that book and it's, it's a legacy that's kind of being carried forward because people are going to remember that author, you know, someone in the future might come along and pick up that book and then start reading it and, and learn something from that author that they never expected. You know, I have to wonder, you know, with podcasts, like what, what's the, the archive for that going to be? Obviously it needs to be digital, but you can't exactly just go and, easily play this back. I mean, now you can obviously with the internet and all this technology, but if that stuff were to up and vanish, it's kind of vanished with it. You know, it's like this, this whole recording is just going to kind of up and disappear. That's kind of a heavy thought to think about, you know, and, and I don't want to think about it. It's too heavy. makes me feel like I'm wasting my time, but I don't feel like I am because who knows, you know, like maybe aliens like don't even need the power or, you know, or, or, or future generations. I keep saying aliens, like they, I have mixed feelings about aliens. They're unidentified. And this episode was about unidentified peoples, but mostly this podcast is about finding our identity. So I don't want to talk about unidentified things like aliens, but I digress. And I think this was kind of a, a a lighter episode that I wanted to put out there. You know, I think the the one in recent memory that is one last identified person that there's a picture that's burned into my memory that a lot of people around my my age or you know people who lived through nine eleven would remember. You know, on the front page of of newspapers as a as a still photo on video broadcasts, but you know the the unknown man the, that was jumping uh, or falling, but he's in midair, and and the backdrop is is one of the twin towers, and he's falling, and you have no idea who this person is, but somebody happened to capture that picture at just the right moment. Although those towers were so tall, you know, you could have seen that man falling and then had the time to take out your camera and take the picture and still capture him falling because that's the kind of height and the, and the amount of time it would take to fall from those buildings. But, you know, his peaceful pose as he's dropping is just is is kind of impactful because he's not flailing his arms. He's just just falling with looks like his his arms are at his side and his legs are just kind of out straight or or almost limp in a sense you know but rigid enough for it doesn't look like he's kicking and it's kind of a, a powerful a powerful memory of of that day you know where he kind of just feels like he resigned himself to to falling because he felt that was it that was all he could do at that point you know i would hope to think that you know possibly like he was dead before he fell and that's just how he started falling and and, and, and you know wasn't flipping around or ta- or tumbling or anything like that but potentially like was knocked out by the blast of of you know the the airplane that exploding on, on this floor that he was on but we'll never know and and there's no way to ever know who that person is. You know, I think people have, have or agencies or archivists or researchers or whatever have tried to identify the person. And there's speculation that he might have been a maintenance worker, maybe based on what they see him wearing in it. But if you look up the falling man from 9-11, you'd see the picture. And it's sad, but it's I think it's it's a powerful picture. And... That's the last unknown person that I'm I'm talking about in this podcast and I guess ending on kind of a sad note in a sense, but you know, I think 
we can learn a lot from from history obviously it, it's usually used <laughs> as a as a teacher uh, as a um educational marker like you look back and you think of what past generations have made as mistakes and you try to learn from those mistakes and you know you look at they say you know history repeats itself you know and and I think if you look throughout history the way wars happen and the way that financial markets crash and the way things just kind of fluctuate in, in our society it's one of those things that you know you can kind of learn like uh, you look at at the mistakes that have have happened maybe in, even just in your immediate lives like watching your parents or something like that you know or your grandparents and, and you can pick up and learn from their mistakes you know or at least that's what the hope is although you know you, you tend to to be like i'm a you know i'm a teenager and or whatever and i'm <laughs> I'm smarter than the the previous generation and, and you think you're going to do better. And then you get in your twenties thinking you're smarter than everybody and you're going to do better and you don't listen. And then you get in your thirties and you're like, man, I really should have listened, but people are going to learn their lessons the way they learn their lessons. But I think it's a good teacher of, of whatever, you know, has come before us. Like it's a good teacher for what, for what to do in the future. I mean, it's obviously like a lot of of educational techniques are are built off of of you know kind of learning the patterns or or finding out ways to do something and you know even like you look at um like i i'm a a developer and like having to write code and and whatnot you know things continue to kind of evolve and new technologies form but there's still some underlying commonality between it that you can learn from so i just kind of randomly went off the rails there and you're just watching because you love to watch train wrecks like i said it's just fascinating can't look away so that i think is gonna be the end of this episode because i don't have anything else to say and i want to thank you for listening to this episode of finding our identity and i look forward to hearing you listen no i look forward to anticipating that you're listening next time something like that i look forward to making the next episode i always do just because i hope it benefits somebody somewhere at some point i know it's not benefiting the nls you know, and I, I told you, I haven't talked about them because of the lawsuit, but you know, those non-listeners and, and I don't even care what my lawyer tells me, but those non-listeners, they have a fight coming. They've, they started to rebel. They formed a little army, but my army's bigger. And, you know, it's going to be kind of like a walking dead showdown. There's like a Negan type dude, except he's got a wiffle ball bat and silly string wrapping it but he's wearing a leather jacket so you know those non-listeners they got a reckoning coming until next time this is finding your identity